objectivity doesn't exist. There's a standard baseline most people agree to, and there are indeed a ton of general opinions, but I bring this up to say that what I find endearing, other people are going to find quite shit. For example, I like saying niche instead of niche, it's how the word's spelt and unlike with epitome, I refuse to acknowledge it as a mistake. I also like the sixth Karen no Kyokai movie to the point where it's my second favorite, just under three. It's a great movie, and though it's not considered to fit in with the style and tone of the rest, I disagree with that sentiment wholeheartedly. In accordance with my niche opinions on things, I rather like the original art and backgrounds for Tsukihime. They're not above criticism, for instance, I don't know what the hell is up with Akia's foot here, plus the coloration looks like Takeuchi just opened up MS Paint and clicked fill, but I find it charming. Really do. Though, I'm not about to sit here and tell you that it looks better than the remake's art. My boy Takeuchi has grown substantially as an artist, and what's been shown for Tsukiri 100% shows his change in quality and style. Now before we continue, and it'll only be minor, but if you've stumbled your way here and know nothing about Tsukihime, then I must warn you that the sprites for a particular character and a main point of contention in this video will lean into spoilery realms. That said, if you've played Melty Blood or something, you legit have nothing to worry about. Charm is the word I'd use to describe Satsuki Yumizuka's sprites in the original Tsukihime. I've stared at them for ungodly amounts of hours, mind you, but I can't be the only one who sees it. The way she holds her arms behind her back and forces a smile in this sprite, her slight change of expressions going from happy to bittersweet in this sprite, the unhinged nature of her sprite when she encounters Shiki in the alleyway. We haven't seen but a scant amount of Sachin sprites for the Tsukihime remake, but if we look at the other characters, Arcoid in particular, we see a similar flair in art with minor facial structure changes to convey subtly different emotions. This isn't like a certain gotcha game, though, so the different poses in tandem with this work wonders. I bring up Satsuki because I think she was the best example of that subtle change in the original, and same with Arc Wade in the remake. Additionally, something the remake is seeming to capitalize on amazingly is tone. I deleted all my captured footage for Tsukihime from the analysis days, but when I went back to recapture footage for this video, it was dripping in the stuff. The scene where Shiki first sees Arcoid, for instance. The music cutting out, and his thoughts getting more and more deranged. It's a simple visual novel, but it capitalizes on what it's got to the best of its ability. I find it really endearing in that way. The remake shows what this scene could have been, however, with Shiki, with Shiki bursting into Arcoid's apartment. It's only shown for like five seconds in the trailer, but it's as detailed with the music being cut and us just hearing Shiki's heartbeat. In this way, the remake seems to be improving upon everything the original did, which is what any remake worth its salt should do. This is quite literally how I imagine this stuff would look in my mind whilst reading, and if it keeps going at the rate it is, the presentation alone will make the remake worth a buy. To get into more niche things, I don't think anyone's shocked when I say that I have a bit of a bias towards the character of Satsuki Yumizuka. After reading Tsukihime for the first time and seeing the remake PV from 10 years ago now, I was bitterly optimistic bitter because it had been nearly 10 years with no announcement, but optimistic because it started off with Satsuki as the focus character. It's like they knew what fans, or at least I, wanted to see in a Tsukihime remake. It is famously what was cut out, and her being the center focus, showing up before even the titular Moon Princess, is emblematic of that. In my free time, I have written and talked about ad nauseum about how a potential Satsuki route might have played out given the cursory knowledge we have, like the list of days and her general demeanor in Tsukihime. That fascination with the what if is ultimately what drew me to take a deeper interest in the character after all. It's something I didn't even think about deeper until my reread of Tsuki ten months back, as evident by that initial Satsuki video. 
I bring this up to say that my main complaint about the modern state of the Tsukihime remake is the continuation of the sidelining of Satsuki. Given what we've seen, I think she's going to take on a similar role to her appearance in the manga version of Tsukihime, which is by all means a cute role, don't get me wrong, but it's not THE role. However, to kind of contradict myself real quick, for the nearsighted routes, that's perfectly fine. Her role in the story shouldn't extend beyond that, and as a matter of fact, it works better that way. I find her randomly going out into the streets at night because she heard that it might be Shiki when the Tono bloodline has been kept under extreme wraps really flimsy anyhow. I think an inciting incident that tips her off to go and become a vampire by accident, way better storytelling. But I'm veering into the realm of fanfiction here, so let's get back on track. It's my belief that the Tsukihime remake will be released in three parts. This is a cope of mine, and I will 100% admit that. The first part is, of course, Arcwade and CL, the near side. The second part ties into a theory I put forth way back in the Satsuki video, of Akia and Satsuki being a middle side of sorts. The last, of course, being the far side, with Hisui and Kohaku. That gives each route substantial breathing room, and if each is going to be roughly the length of the OG Tsukihime, then that would probably be the best way to go about it. It'd be a while between releases most likely, but we're Tsukihime fans. Waiting is in our blood, like incest runs through the Nanaya clan, or inversion impulses in Tono blood. Speaking of incest though, as this is being released on console, we must talk about the subject of Eroge. As some of you may know if you've watched my past videos on Tsukihime, I actually find the use of it in Tsukihime to be some of the better usage across the medium. It's typically used to further the plot in meaningful ways, i.e. Arcoid's bloodlust being akin to Shiki's sexual urges. Personally, this isn't a make or break thing for me though. I'm not about to sit here and tell you that Tsukihime needs Eroge to be good. For the near side routes. The far side, however, <laughs> is a much different story. I'll try not to repeat myself from the made video, and here's a timestamp because I am about to talk about major spoilers if you would like to skip this part. But I fear for Kohaku's characterization in particular if all mentions of sex are cut entirely. The near side with Ark and CL? That's fine. Those stories don't particularly need it, though as stated I do like the parallels it brings up between Ark and Shiki, and in the case of CL it just hampers the story. To stretch it further, I wouldn't be a fan personally, but in the case of Aki and Hisui even, that could still work. Being it ends the same way, I think the Akia route would suffer without them having one night of passion before Shiki dies, but it is by all means workaroundable. And hell, for Hisui's route, having Shiki drink her blood to stay sane the same way Akia does sounds like it would fuck with his mental state amazingly. However, I'm gonna find it really sad if the scene of Kohaku learning that sex can be a thing of love is cut from the remake. I really am. Jank Aroge writing aside, I find that scene really beautiful, and the story would be actively substantially worse without it. Now it can function without showing the sex on screen, mind you, so I really hope at least allusions to it are kept in, with Koaku's stuff in particular given the focus it needs, because that's half of why her route is so good. For more info, see the Maid video, all 1 hour and 40 something minutes of it. Honestly, in an ideal world, this wouldn't even be a worry because the remake would be released on PC, and we'd get to enjoy those sweet Sachin Sweat driplets in HD. So essentially, what I'm saying is that the remake is great, but I, sitting here writing this in full Satsuki cosplay, am cautiously optimistic about the far side, and need more Sachin content. As a side note, however, these sprites we do have of her are beautiful, and will likely be my permanent Twitter AVI. Also, her remake design? The best design of anything. Get fucked all other character designs. Is there anything else the remake needs to make it truly Kino, though? Is there something that would really move it from a 9 to a 10? Yes. The answer is a simple one, too. 
Type Moon needs to acknowledge that they have fans outside of Japan. Not everyone has the time or drive to learn a foreign language, and though fan translations are wonderful, Type Moon is undoubtedly missing out on a large market of people. Go to the comments section on any video regarding Tsukihime that Type Moon has put out. Nearly all of them are English-speaking fans just begging for a translation, or at the very least, to be acknowledged. Like, seriously, Kinoku Nasu could walk out onto a stage and call all of us Westerners filthy and disgusting, and I would at least be happy, because, you know, the hope would be dead. <laughs> They sunk their teeth into the outside world with their shitty gacha game. The least they can do is release the remake into other languages, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm coping, but you get it, you get it. I get that the Tsukihime remake is a visual novel and that's a lot of text, but conversely, Type Moon has had 20 years and is a multi-billion dollar company at this point. I personally see no excuse. It'd literally only make them more money. But perhaps money is the main issue here. Not on Type Moon's side, but over here in the West. Take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. Full stop. This is purely speculation, but it is widespread speculation. Fate Stay Night is one of the biggest visual novels of all time, if not the biggest. Yet, even in 2012 when it was getting re-released, there was not a hint of an English release. The 2012 landscape does kind of make sense for this though, but I personally feel that Fate had the opportunity to be VVN in the West rather than Doki Doki Literature Club for introducing people into the medium, but that's personal conjecture. To get back to the main point, there were, at one point, talks about getting Fate Stay Night released over in the West. Manga Gamer was the company responsible. You may know them as the ones that released Higurashi and Euphoria over here in the land of the setting sun, but negotiations suddenly ended. It should be noted that visual novels, though still niche, have a loyal following. I mean, hell, I think anyone in the Type Moon community could tell you that much. It's because of this that the rumor goes, Type Moon sets the fees for the rights ridiculously high so high that any company couldn't break even. Hence why one of the most popular visual novels of all time can only be read through a fan translation. It's no secret that Type Moon and Nasu himself are a bit behind on the times. If him wanting the remake to only be available on consoles isn't evident of that, though, let's be honest, that's probably just to avoid piracy. Though it is also something that would have made sense when Mahoyo was released back in 2012, then the non-affirmation of any fanbase outside of a Japanese-speaking one is safer when it comes to scammy gacha games definitely should be. I'd like to say Type Moon won't survive if it doesn't update its business practices, but that's clearly not true. I and many others have already pre-ordered the remake in spite of no English version in sight. Now hope isn't lost by any means. Hollow Moon is doing masterful work on a Mahoyo translation, and have already stated that they fully intend on sinking their teeth into the Sugiri as soon as possible. For clarification, for those of you who aren't, you know, confident about me bringing up Mahoyo, as Kohaku Simp extraordinaire Koaku Dori has pointed out, Mahoyo has had a troubled history with multiple different cancelled translation projects. Sugihime Remake will not be the same unless some kind of freak accident happens. It's not like it'll be unreadable, though it is undoubtedly a shame in my eyes that no official translation is probably ever going to be in sight, though uh, of course Melty Blood's coming over here, cause uh, fighting games go wah. Other than that though, the remake is looking all around wonderful. I teared up watching the trailer upon seeing it for the first time, and when I rewatched it today in preparation for this script, I still got emotional. Its presentation is practically flawless, and that redux of the Tsukihime title theme is divine. Just listen to it for a sec. Amazing. And if this is anything to go off, the music is going to be positively godlike. All that in mind, there is one other thing I'd like to touch on briefly before we go, that being the new Melty Blood. I've only recently, within the past few months, gotten into playing Actress again, but after acquiring a deeper understanding of the mechanics-ish, I have to say, this looks wonderful. The little animations when a special move is done is a feature I didn't know I needed so badly. 
and the character introductions are so good that Smash fans are molding. The little descriptions for each character is what really brings it home for me. The free-willed princess of the true ancestors. The arrow of the church, hunting heretics in the name of the Lord. Current head of the noble Tono family. A quiet yet deeply affectionate maid. A young girl who brightens the Tono residence with her smile. A high school student with the ability to see the death of everything with his mystic eyes of death perception. It's nothing too fancy, but it in tandem with showing off a bit of their fighting prowess and style in the game is trailer making perfection. Hype Machine is running at 100, and what really kicked it into high gear was this little thing they did with the title at the end. It gets cut up with the mystic eyes of death perception, a detail I've seen no one talk about, but I thought was the coolest shit ever. Anywho, that's it from me. This was a Patreon requested video, and if you would like one, visit the Patreon page and consider making a pledge. Thank you all for watching, and thanks in particular to my patrons. Engage with the video and all that nonsense. See ya!